In this video, we're going to prove the Schwarz inequality, also known as the Cauchy Schwarz inequality. So, this is just a difference in name, it doesn't really matter what, what name you use. And here I've written down the three laws concerning inner products, which will be used for our reference later on. And so, now let's move on with the proof. So, the Cauchy Schwarz inequality quality tells us that the inner product between two vectors, uh, if you take the absolute value square, this expression is always smaller than or equal to the inner product of the first vector times the inner product of the second vector. So first, of, before I move on with the proof, I'm going to give you an intuition behind the idea presented in this, in this statement. So you can actually easily verify that this is true for the case of Euclidean vectors, because if you check out two Euclidean vectors, let's say this vector is equal to a, this vector is equal to b, and you have a theta over here, you can see that if you take the dot product of these two vectors, so remember, a dot product is really just a particular instance of the concept of an inner product. So a dot product is a kind of inner product. So if I take the dot product of a and b, this is by definition equal to the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b times cosine theta. And then if I square both sides, this is equal to the magnitude of a squared times the magnitude of b squared cosine squared theta. And I know that this, expre if this expression is always smaller than or equal to the magnitude of a squared times the magnitude of b squared because cosine squared theta is a number between 0 and 1 so if I remove this uh, this is just uh, the remaining term is going to be has to be larger than this term so that's why I'm sure that the magnitude square of a, uh, a and b is always larger than or equal to this term and if you compare this expression with the cauchy schwarz inequality you can see that it's basically saying the same thing so here the dot product, is, which is the inner product, so you have the inner product. And then on the right hand side you have the magnitude square, which is really just the inner product with itself squared. Because if you think back in Euclidean vectors, the magnitude square is just the dot product of A with itself. So you can see that in the case of Euclidean vectors, you can easily verify uh, the cauchy schwarz inequality with this geometrical argument. Uh, so it turns out that the cauchy schwarz inequality is also true for other kinds of vectors. So even if we're not dealing with Euclidean vectors, this inequality is also true. So I only showed you this uh, example here just so you can gain an intuition behind what this statement actually really means. So if you find this a bit too abstract, you can always think about this. Uh, think about the case of Euclidean vectors. So it's because of this cosine theta uh, that makes uh, this statement here true. So. Uh, so this is for the case of Euclidean vectors. So now let's try to prove the statement for other kinds of vectors. So let's prove that this is going to be the general statement. We're going to prove that this is indeed true for all kinds of vectors. And then we're going to do this by first defining a vector called gamma. And then I'm going to define this as being equal to beta minus the inner product of alpha with beta divided by the inner product of alpha with itself times the vector alpha. And then we're going to start off by taking the inner product of gamma with itself. So this is equal to taking the inner product of gamma with this expression. So all I'm doing is just I'm substituting this expression down into the inner product. And then using the, the third rule, I can simplify this as the inner product of gamma with beta minus these, uh, these terms. Uh, times the inner product of gamma with alpha. So you can see that all I'm doing is I'm applying the third rule. And then so you can see that if we want to evaluate this expression, we have an inner product of gamma with beta and we have an inner product of gamma with alpha. So let's try to evaluate these two terms uh, separately first. So in order to find the inner product of gamma with beta, I'm going to first find the inner product of beta with gamma. So once I find this, I can easily find the inner product of gamma with beta by just taking the conjugate. So I can just easily use the first rule, take the conjugate, and that would give me the inner product of gamma with beta. But now let's start with the inner product of beta with gamma. So once again, I'm just going to substitute the expression for gamma inside the inner product. So we have alpha and alpha times alpha. And then once again, I'm going to use the third rule. And using the third rule, this gives us the inner product of beta with beta minus the inner product of alpha with beta divided by the inner product of alpha with alpha times the inner product of beta with alpha. And then you know that by the first rule, the inner product of beta with alpha is just equal to the inner product of alpha with beta 
conjugate. And so you can see that we have the inner product of alpha with beta times the inner product of alpha with beta conjugate. And you know if you multiply a complex number with the conjugate of, of itself, it gives you the absolute value of that complex number squared. So you see that the entire inner product of beta with gamma is entirely real. There are no imaginary components. Because an inner product of a vector with itself is always real, and then this term in the numerator is also real. So this entire term is going to be real. And so that's why, remember, we started off trying to find the inner product of gamma with beta. And by the first rule, we know that this is equal to the inner product of beta with gamma conjugate. And since this term is entirely real, taking the conjugate doesn't really change it. So uh, the inner product of gamma with beta is just equal to this expression. So now we've already found this first term. So the second term we need to find is the inner product of gamma with alpha. So we're going to do something similar. So instead of finding the inner product of gamma with alpha, we're going to find the inner product of alpha with gamma. So later on, we can just take the conjugate to find the inner product with, of gamma with alpha. And then once again, I'm just going to substitute the expression for gamma. So we have inner product of alpha with alpha times the inner product of times the vector alpha. And then once again, we are going to invoke the third rule. And then this expression just becomes the inner product of alpha with beta minus the inner product of alpha with beta divided by the inner product of alpha with alpha. And then you have two alphas here, which gives us the inner product of alpha with alpha. So this cancels out perfectly with this. And so you have an inner product of alpha with, gamma, uh, alpha with beta minus the inner product of alpha with beta. So of course these just cancel out and give you zero, which is always a good thing. So because this term is equal to zero, this entire term is going to be equal to zero because this term is zero. So uh, it turns out that the inner product of gamma with gamma is just equal to the inner product of gamma with beta, which we found is equal to this. And so now we can move on with our proof. So we have found that the inner product of gamma with gamma is equal to this expression. So beta and beta minus the inner product of alpha with beta absolute value square divided by the inner product of alpha with alpha. And then you can tell that by the second rule uh, that an inner product of a vector with itself is always larger than or equal to zero. So you can tell that the inner product of gamma with gamma is always larger than or equal to zero. And so you can see that with a bit of rearranging, we can just move this over and then multiply the alphas to the other side. You can see that the cauchy schwarz inequality must be true. And so there you have it. This is how you prove the cauchy schwarz inequality. So you can see that the cauchy schwarz inequality isn't really just a geometrical ph phenomenon, which we uh, which we have found in the case of Euclidean vectors. For it, all, it is also valid for all other kinds of vectors because of the restrictions imposed by these three laws. So that is why the cauchy schwarz inequality is true. And then as a side note, uh, I've actually encountered the, the... the first time I actually encountered the cauchy schwarz inequality was in high school. And back then, uh, we weren't taught what vectors were, and the cauchy schwarz inequality that we encountered back in high school was in an algebraic form. So you can actually also prove this without having to resort to, to inner products. You can actually prove this using simple algebra. So that's just something extra that I think yeah, would be interesting.